Thank you. Let's zoom in on a well-known capital city. Here is its location, and here it is in close-up, showing the river that runs through it. And if you were to stand on Westminster Bridge here on a late summer's evening, you would undoubtedly see this view here of Westminster Palace or the Houses of Parliament. And this same view attracted the famous French Impressionist painter over a hundred years ago, Claude Monet, to the same scene. He painted it a number of times, such as this painting that we see here, which he created in 1904. What's striking about this is that we can't see the buildings clearly. And that was very common in London throughout the 19th century and early 20th century. A year after he painted it, Dr. Henry Antoine de Ver prepared a paper for an important meeting on public health in London. He called it fog and smoke, and in the paper he invented a new word. He put the two words together, smoke and fog equals smog. Smog was an environmental problem that afflicted London for a long time. And the smoke that was half of the smog was very visible, not only in London, but also in cities and towns throughout the UK, such as here in Widnes in the northwest of England. Low-grade coal was being burnt to heat homes and to provide energy for making things. The coal was abundant, so it was relatively cheap, and it did its job well. It was convenient. But this came at a huge environmental and social cost. People were breathing in emissions. People were contracting lung diseases, and a great number of people sadly died. And this came to a catastrophic level in 1952 when there was the Great Smog of London. For several days, a toxic, thick smog engulfed the whole city, and it drew the whole city to a standstill. Imagine not being able to see much further than two meters in front of where you're standing or when you're outside. And it wasn't only just visible, it was also very harmful. Described as the worst air pollution crisis in European history, estimates range between eight and 10,000 deaths, sadly, that occurred just over two days. Something drastic needed to happen in response. And over the coming few years and decades, the UK government did what it could to solve this through passing laws to clean the air up. In 1956, there was the famous Clean Air Act, where in certain areas, people had to use cleaner, smokeless fuels. Power stations had to relocate outside of cities. And in 1968, the minimum height of a chimney stack was increased. Now, sulfurous dioxide and other air pollutants are still persistent problems in London, but the problem has been greatly reduced thanks to drastic action that has been taken to hopefully prevent a future smog from occurring in the UK. Let's zoom in on another famous capital city. Here is its location, and here is a close-up showing the river that runs through it. And if you were to stand round about here on the banks of Bangkok's Chow Phraya River, on a late evening, you probably wouldn't see smog. Smog isn't something that occurs with any frequency, although air pollution is becoming more of a concern. You would likely see an image like this, we'd see the Boom and Bond Bridge in the distance. And then if you looked around, you'd see another kind of emission. And I think that would be very likely. And to show the emission that I'm referring to, this video gives us a sense just by panning from left to right to look at the same scene. But we need to look at close-up. So this video I took as I walked along the river's beach, and it's in slow-mo, and it shows the emissions I'm talking about. And the emissions are plastic bags, plastic straws, plastic bottles, plastic cups, plastic cigarette lighters, more plastic bags, plastic, plastic, and more plastic. Now, I've deliberately used the phrase emissions. A lot of researchers are referring to our throwaway waste now as emissions. If you stop and think about it, there is a similarity between our plastic emissions and the air emissions that cause the great smog. Coal was burnt, it was dug out of the Earth's crust, and it was burnt and carbon-based compounds were released into the environment. 
in the atmosphere. In the case of plastic, oil is drilled from the Earth's crust, is converted into abundant, cheap, and very convenient plastic, which is carbon-based and released into the environment, not into the atmosphere, but into great landfills and often into waterways. This is a collection of plastic emissions that were recovered from the River Maas in the Netherlands. There are big differences, of course, between plastic emissions and air emissions. And for me, I think the biggest difference is that plastic emissions don't affect us so directly. We're not as alarmed by plastic emissions because we don't breathe them into our bodies. And yet, the United Nations has declared plastic pollution as a planetary crisis. So if that's the case, what drastic changes will we make to address this crisis? Will we ever be as shocked by plastic pollution as we have been by air emissions pollution in the past? I think a good number of people do understand that plastic pollution is a problem. We understand that the plastic I showed earlier is going to make its way into the sea not far away. We understand that our coastal areas are becoming blighted by plastic emissions as it washes up on our shore. A good number of us have a good grasp that a large, unimaginable quantity of plastic is spiraling through the oceans on currents known as gyres. So it catches our attention when we learn that the plastic emissions are reaching far off, uninhabited, remote islands in the middle of the ocean, such as the Midway Atoll, shown here. And we still flinch at pictures like this, where we see how the plastic emissions are affecting bird life, where chicks are fed the plastic emissions by their undiscerning parents. And something like this is clearly bad. It's very bad. Our actions are killing animals. But the raw truth is, our actions aren't killing ourselves. So an image like this can be put to the back of our minds very quickly. It can fade from our memories, even when we reach the end of a presentation. Except this isn't the end of the presentation, because we haven't figured out the whole story yet. When we learn about gyres, we are often shown images like this, and we are asked to imagine subcontinents of plastic floating around the oceans. But the reality is a lot of the plastic can't be seen. Researchers tracking our plastic emissions have a problem on their hands. They can't see where a lot of it is ending up. It seems to be disappearing. One plausible solution seems to be that a lot of the plastic is making its way, filtering and settling to the bottom of the oceans. So it really is out of sight and out of mind. But another answer is that large parts of our plastic emissions are fragmenting into smaller pieces due to wave action and sunlight. So now we need to talk about microplastics. Microplastics are very small pieces of plastic, five millimeters or less across. And in actual fact, a lot of our households are releasing microplastics for, directly from the house into waterways. For example, a lot of microplastics are in the form of tiny little beads that still exist in products like exfoliators. Clothes release a lot of microplastics. Tiny fibers of nylon are accumulating in the oceans due to our washing cycles. Scientists have started to refer to the plastic in the oceans as some kind of giant plastic soup. And I think the word's really apt because animals are eating this soup. They're literally gobbling it up by the ton. Current estimates are that some 700 species of animal eat plastic in the oceans. Here's a larval perch, which is a very small, tiny baby fish. And you can see it's eaten some microbeads of plastic. We also need to talk about nanoplastic. And this is something even smaller. This is microscopic. Because when we understand that our plastic emissions can get so small that they can't be seen by the human eye, things get interesting. Scientists have confirmed that nanoplastics can pass through the cell wall, the membrane of an animal cell, as it can in a human cell. And so it becomes a lot easier for this plastic to make its way through the so-called food chain. And scientists are suggesting now there's a very strong chance that we, we here, have plastic in our bodies. And not just from eating contaminated animals, but also from plastic chemicals leaching out of plastic packaging into our foods and into our drinks and directly into our bodies. 
So now that we understand that plastic emissions can make their way into our bodies, as we saw was the case with air emissions, how does that change things? Well, the good news is it's not, there's no confirmation that plastic is killing people at this stage. It's still under very early research. We don't know the long-term effects of plastic being in our bodies. But this is where my train of thought gets a little bit muddy. And a scientist in me says, I shouldn't say what I'm about to say without clear evidence. But if this was a betting game, I'd be willing to wager that no good things will come of plastic being in our bodies. In fact, I'd go further and suggest it's only a matter of time, perhaps, before negative consequences are confirmed. Now, it's not really fair to compare the plastic crisis to the Great Smog of London, but we do need to rethink how we look at disposable plastic waste the same way that London had to have a good think about its use of cheap grade coal. I think that every time we throw away a piece of plastic, whether it's a plastic straw, plastic spoon, plastic cup, a coffee cup, a bag, we are polluting, we are emitting pollution. We could almost reimagine bins brimming with plastic as mini chimney stacks throughout our cities. And I think in time to come, we'll look back at this and, and be shocked and dismayed as to why we allowed this to carry on. But we've got to be realistic and we can't wait for consumers to change their habits and minds for the big change to happen. We need more drastic change. We need government legislation. We need our equivalent of the, uh, of the Clean Air Act for plastic. And the really good news is that governments are responding. Some governments around the world are responding with the seriousness that this deserves. Plastic's being taxed or plastic, unnecessary plastic is being banned altogether. And I, for one, really hope that this major change extends to the rest of the world very quickly. Thank you very much.